Hey everyone, you're watching The Esperanza 243. You're watching my book reading project of The Westing Game, part 16. Pretty exciting, I think. 16 videos already, and we're, I'd say, halfway through the book. A little sad in my a little sad in my calculations, but hey. I believe in chap in uh, part 15, we learned a little more about, uh, we finally got to see Chris and Dr. Denton Deer uh, finally communicate, which is really cool, which is really nice for a change, because we never, we hardly ever get to see them communicate about their clues, you know considering everyone was snowbound inside Sunset Towers and the doctor was snowbound in the hospital. So that was nice to see. And then um, another bomb happened. Not surprisingly, actually, um, if you've read the book. But Sidel actually gets injured for a change. She does not have that, um, what was it? Um, she doesn't have that wasting disease or whatever. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and get to the reading, actually. Um, where we ended was uh, where where we ended was at the hospital, actually. Angela decided to check up on Sidel, and she learns that she doesn't have the wasting disease. She was just trying to get attention. And that's where we are. Without makeup, without jewelry, cloth only in a white hospital gown, she looked older, softer. She looked like a sad and homely human being. You talk to the doctors? It's a simple fracture. What else? Sadell turned her face to the wall. The doctor says your disease is incurable, but you could have a remission lasting five years, even more, if you take good care of yourself and don't overdo it. The doctor said that? Maybe a few people could be trusted. Did you bring my makeup? I must look a mess. In the overstuffed tapestry bag under Sadell's cosmetic case, Angela found a letter. It was a strange letter, written in a tense and rigid hand. Forgive me, my daughter. God bless you, my child. Delight in your love, and the devil take doctor dear. Hast thou found me, O oh, mine enemy? The time draws near. Taped at the bottom were two clues. Thy beautiful. <gasps> we get two more clues! Ding, 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 ding! We get more clues. Chapter 15. Fact and Gossip. Friday was back to normal, if the actions of suspicious would-be heirs competing for a $200 million prize could be considered normal. At school, Theo studied, Doug Ho ran, and Turtle was twice sent to the principal's office for having been caught with a transistor radio plugged in her ear. <laughs> the coffee shop was full of diners. Shinho's restaurant had reopened, too, but no one came. J.J. Ford presided at the bench, and Sandy McSouthers presided at the front door, whistling, chatting, collecting tidbits of gossip, and adding some of his own. Well, duh. Florin Bambach, her strained eyes shielded by her dark glasses, drove Turtle to school on her way to the broker's office and picked her up in the late afternoon with the sheet of prices copied from the moving tape. They had lost $3,000 in five days. Paper losses, Turtle said. Doesn't mean a thing. Besides, I didn't pick these stocks. Mr. Westing did. Did he? The dressmaker thought of the clue Chris had dropped. No stock symbol had five letters or even resembled the word plain. But Flora Bumbach played fair and kept the secret to herself. 
Four people stood in the driveway's melting snow, shivering as the sun dropped behind sunset towers. The fifth jogged in place. No smoke had risen from the chimney since that fateful Halloween. Still, they stared up at the Westinghouse, murder on their minds. He looks too peaceful to have been murdered, Turtle said. She sneezed, and Sandy handed her a Westing tissue. How would you know, Doug replied. How many people have you seen murdered? Turtle's right, her friend Sandy said. If Westing expected it, he'd have seen it coming. His face would have looked scared. Maybe he didn't see it coming, Theo argued. The killer was very cunning, Westing said. I, I read a mystery once where the victim was allergic to bee stings and a murderer lets a bee in through a, an open window. The window wasn't open, Turtle said, wiping her nose. Besides, Westing would have heard the buzzing and jumped out of bed. Doug had an idea. Maybe the murderer injected bee venom in his veins. Otis Amber flung his arms in the air. Whoever said Sam Westing was allergic to bees? Doug tried again. How about snake venom? Or poison? Doctors know lots of poisons that make it look like heart attacks. Turtle almost kicked Doug. Track meat or not. Her father was a doctor. She would not have minded if he had said interns. I once heard about a murderer who stabbed his victim with an icicle, the doorman said. It melted, leaving no trace of a murder weapon. I'm not going to say it. This is a kid's book. <laughs> or not a kid's book, family book. Uh... That's a good one, Turtle exclaimed appreciatively. Sandy had more. Then there was a Roman who choked on a single goat hair someone put in his milk. And there was the Greek poet who was killed when an eagle dropped a tortoise on his bald head. Maybe Westing was just sleeping until Turtle stumbled and fell on his head. That's not funny, Doug Ho! How could she ever have had a crush on that disgusting jerk? Doug would not let up. And who was that suspicious person in red boots I saw opening the hoods of cars in the parking lot the other morning? He looked at Turtle's booted feet. The thief stole my boots and put them back again. They leak. A likely story, Tabitha Ruth. Her mom should never have said her name. Doug pulled on her braid and ran into the lobby at full speed. Sandy placed a large hand on Turtle's shoulder, a comforting hand and a restraining one. Otis Amber hopped on his bike. Can't stand around chit-chatting about a murder that never happened. Sam Westing was a madman, crazy as a bed bug. He pedaled off, shouting back, We ain't murderers! None of us! Theo could not agree. If there was no murder, there was no answer. And without an answer, no one could win. My personal opinion, not true. Sandy, did anybody leave Sunset Towers on Halloween night before Turtle and Doug? The doorman scratched his head under his hat, thinking, One day seems like the next. People coming and going, I can't remember. Try. Sandy scratched harder. Only ones I recall are Otis, Amber, and Crow. They left together about five o'clock. Thanks. Theo hurried into the building to check his clues. Turtle had no reason to suspect Otis, Amber, or Crow, or any of the heirs. Money was the answer. Her only problem was that dumb stock market. It didn't want to play the game. S Sandy, tell me another story. Okay, let's see. Once, long ago in the olden days, there was this soothsayer who predicted the day of his own death. That day came, and the soothsayer waited to die, and waited some more, but nothing happened. He was so surprised and so happy to be alive that he laughed and laughed. 
Then, at one minute to midnight, he suddenly died. He died laughing. He died laughing, Turtle repeated thoughtfully. That's profound, Sandy. That's very profound. Where's everybody? The apartment was empty. As usual, Jake Wexler decided that Shin Ho's was going to have a paying customer. I'd like a table if you're not too crowded. I think I can squeeze you in, Ho said, leading the podiatrist through the empty <laughs> restaurant. You must have liked those spare ribs. Yeah, sure. Jake watched his wife slowly stack papers at the reservation's desk. At last, seeming to rec recognize him, she walked over. Jake returned his unlit cigar to his pocket. Grace hated the smell. I've already eaten, Grace said, sitting down. Hello to you too, Jake replied. He probably thinks that's funny. Since when do people go around saying hello to their husbands? What's new with you, Grace? Where are the kids? And what are all those presents doing on the coffee table? It's not your birthday, and it's not our anniversary. What was she so upset about? Or is it? No, it isn't. Those are gifts for Angela. The wedding shower is tomorrow. Don't worry, you're not supposed to be there. Just girls. The doorbell was ringing all morning. I couldn't leave the apartment for an instant. One at the time he delivered them. The smirking fool, and each time he shouted, Boom! She looked especially attractive today, Jake thought. Between the ringing doorbell and the booms, she had managed time for the beauty parlor and the sun lamp. Mr. Ho set the spare ribs on the table and lowered himself to a chair. Grace lost her scowl. Since you're here, Jake, I'd like your opinion on the advertising campaign I'm planning. Jimmy and I are having a slight disagreement. I say that Shinho's sounds like every other Chinese restaurant to English-speaking ears. English-speaking ears? Jake bit his lip in an effort to keep silent. I see the restaurant needs a name people won't forget, Grace continued. A man, a name like Ho's on first. Jake could not help himself. He tried to cover a loud guffaw with the louder coughing. Ho pounded him on the back and apologized for the ginger. You remember that old baseball routine, Jake? Grace prompt prompted. Yes, he did. Who's on second? No, what's on second? Who's on first? It's an idiotic name, Ho argued. Ho's on first. Sounds like my restaurant is on first street. Or worse yet, on the first floor. Customers will end up in the coffee shop drinking dri dishwater tea. Not the way I'll promote it, they won't, Grace insisted. Well, what's your opinion, Jake? The podiatrist put down the spare rib he was about to bite into. Ho's on first is a dandy name. Before he could pick up the rib again, Ho whisked the plate off the table. Who elected you judge anyhow? The judge returned to Sunset Towers with clippings from the newspaper's files. A faithful Sandy was waiting, hoping to interrogate both George Theodoricus and James Shinho. They alternated their dinner orders. One night they would order up, the next night they would order down. To their disappointment, Theo delivered up. They had no questions to ask him, but he had one for the doorman. Chess? Sandy replied. Sorry, don't know the game. I'm always at hearts, though. Shooter, they call me. Such a liar. <laughs> Theo left them to their sandwiches and their work. The private detective the judge had hired was still investigating the heirs, so tonight's project would be the Westing family. Judge Ford opened the thin folder on Mrs. Westing. Mrs. Westing, no first name, no main name, and the f few newspaper photographs in which she appeared, always with her husband. The captions read, Mr. and Mrs. Samuel W. Westing, a shadowy figure, a shy woman. She seemed to slip behind her husband before the camera clicked. 
or had her face masked by a floppy hat brim. A slim woman dressed in the fashion of the time. Long, loose chemis, narrow shoes with sharply pointed toes and high spiked heels. A nervous woman, her hands especially in the later pictures, were blurred. In the final fo photograph, a black veil covered her face. She seemed to lean unsteadily against the stocky frame of her husband as they left the cemetery. Sandy reported his findings, and I am going to stop there. Pretty exciting, pretty interesting stuff, isn't it? Pretty interesting stuff. All right, the next video you will see will be part 17, and that will be next week. See you guys later. This is the Esperanza 243, signing off.